Sam's asking, uh, what are the must-learn ops for every project? I've really been enjoying the math chop, for example. Uh, this is actually a good question. So I think if you go back a bunch of coaching calls in, in our archives on the Facebook group, there's also one where I, there's actually two different ones. One where I did the ops I hate the most, and then one where I talk about the ops I enjoyed the most. But also a really good reference for you is, I'll put it in the chat here. It's a blog post I wrote uh, quite a while ago, not super long ago, but it was actually where I made a list exactly of what you want to know, which is, you know, these are the operators I think you have to know and get like pretty good at to really have an easier time in touch designer. And for most of them, I listed kind of some of those reasons why. And actually I can share my screen as I'm scrolling around and talking about this. Some of them are obvious, like in tops, you got to know a movie file in. Some of them I find are less obvious, like fit top. I find a lot of people aren't using fit top to the full potential. Um, level top, obviously. Blur, composite, noise, filters, logic, math. So, you know, I kind of try and lay this out at least for all the families of like here, you know, these are the ones I think if you can really handle these ones solidly, you're going to have a, a pretty good time. So I think that's some place to start. Uh, moving up to actually your more conceptual question, Ram was asking, as a new touch designer, -er, I'm running into a lot of problems creating the products in my head on TD. I get stuck a lot where to start projects. You know, do I start with tops, sops, or chops, for example, and where to go immediately from there? I want to make a lot of generative art, and I haven't found a good general path to start and follow. Now, Bram, actually, can you in the chat give me what your background is before you got into Touch Designer? What what world do you come from? Computer science. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'll come back to the computer science point in a bit, mainly JS. I know a lot of JS people have, have pain with the Python, but well, solidarity, you know. Not that I know JS, but just solidarity in general. Um, so let me break down the, my approach to how to solve this problem, because it's a bit of a, a conceptual one. There's no like really good answer, but I have a bunch of suggestions that I think are useful. Because the real challenge is two sub-challenges. One of them is to think procedurally, and one of them is to think procedurally in Touch Designer. Now, if you don't come from a node-based background, you know, you come from a JavaScript background, so you're probably familiar with a lot of like 3JS and other frameworks that I think should have like a lot of similarities with thinking procedurally, wherein that like you aren't allowed to go below a certain level, right? You have these predefined blocks and you have to think about getting from your abstract goal, whittling down into sub goals until basically you land at the layer of touch designer blocks. Yeah, web canvas stuff, processing stuff, all very similar in that sense as well. Now, once you get down to that level of thinking procedurally, I think this is another challenge that there's no really good answer for right now, which is that then you have to think procedurally in Touch Designer because Touch Designer is one of those applications where if you think the way Touch Designer wants you to, to use it and work, and really like if you think like the developers, then like everything is pretty easy and the power is unlimited and like you don't have to optimize because you just did it the right way to begin with. Now, the problem is if you think against the grain of TD, even if it's by accident, you, life might be a little bit miserable where, you know, optimizing is so impossible and the projects are always going to be slow and everything is like, feels so difficult. Um, so that's why I'm always a, a big talker about like, you know, think, you know, think like this if you're trying to build this or here's the workflow of getting this thing up and running, which I think is more important than the actual nodes that you're going to use. Because as long as you think in the right path, you'll find the nodes naturally. So a few suggestions that I had for this issue are, one is never be afraid to just like ask, especially on our HQ group, like by all means, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm here for and what we're all here for is like, if you ask, you know, I'm trying to do this concept, what would your approach be? You know, I'm more than happy to help dive in there and be like, you know what, like uh, start with tops. If you work with tops, you can have these kind of outputs. And if you work with chops, you'll kind of get this kind of data out. Um, so that's like a good one because that can help guide your approach. And, you know, I'm all a big proponent of like self reflection feedback loops. So even before you ask on the group, you can say, I was thinking of doing something like this. 
then the nice thing is not only can you compare what you would thought as your first instinct to like, you know, what myself or anyone else says, but then I can also see what you were thinking, guess how you got to that thought process and then try and steer you into a more appropriate thought process. Uh, second thing is just go through a lot of tutorials um, because one of those things is, is just repetition of doing stuff in touch designer as someone else would do it kind of builds up your reflexes for then you kind of going off the path and you're saying, oh, well, I want to do this now. You know, how should I approach it? I think our tutorials are really great for that kind of stuff, especially because I, I try and talk about those general workflows and thought processes a bunch. But there are also many other people who do great tutorials. Uh, Matthew Reagan, for example, has a lot of material on his website that goes really in depth on techniques and maybe why you want to use them and when to use them. Um, for also my blog, although it doesn't have a lot of project files per se, since it's essentially just me talking a lot into like WordPress, uh, you might pick up a lot of thought process patterns when I'm talking about either features or architecture of projects or kind of just like general workflows. Uh, another good option is to actually hang out on the Touch Designer Discord. And Bram, are you, are you on the Touch Designer Discord channel? This is like the public uh, touch down a Discord channel, and I'll read your question. I'm not on Discord. So it's uh, TD Discord. I'll type it in the little chat here, tddiscord.com. You go there, you hop on, and there's just lots of members hanging out, chatting about all kinds of stuff. You know, some people asking about this, some people asking about that. I'm in the business channel talking about money. That's like, if you want to find me, come to the business time channel or the horror stories. That's also my favorite channel. Um, and you were asking, so on your reflection point, what point in the pipeline is best to start asking questions? I don't think there's a big difference when you start asking questions, as long as you always complete the loop. Because what I often see happens is somebody will ask a question and never give themselves the answer and compare that answer against what they actually ended up going down the path of. I like to ask questions really early on and then I kind of just like plow through and then I usually get to like either a good checkpoint or the end and then I kind of review you know, how, how, where did I get to? Was it easy? And I probably actually have a lot of blog posts on self-reflection that I can find afterwards. Uh, reflection, let me see here, I'm just looking on the blog. I'll have to find them after. But I talk about reflection because I think it's like a pretty important thing. But yeah, anytime you ask a question, I think it's great. You know, you ask the question, you presuppose what you think is the answer, you go a bunch of the way in, and then you reflect like, was this the correct answer? And then even then you branch out and ask other people like, here's what the question I was trying to, here's the thing I was trying to solve, here's how I approached it, this is where I got, what do you think? Now, I think also the Discord, like I mentioned, is really helpful because that one's nice because there's just lots of people talking in there on their own. So even if you didn't want to be the kind of like originator of a discussion, you'll still pick up a lot of stuff where, you know, there's a lot of high level touch liner devs in there just chatting away, shooting the shit on like, oh, trying to do this and trying to do this and anyone did it yet or, you know, have anyone used this hardware? There's a lot of good stuff in there. My final thing was to reconsider your approach to thinking about touch designer. And this is one that I've been trying to figure out how to teach, but it's been difficult. But I think I'm getting close because here's the, the, the tricky part with all this, right, is that on paper, we see a really big difference between these operator families. You know, we see tops and it's like textures. We see chops and it's like channels and numbers flying around. We see sops and it's like, oh man, these are like 3D things. But fundamentally, they're all mostly numbers, except for DATs, you have a little bit of data, but most projects actually live in the top SOP and CHOP realm of things. And then DATs are usually just for like dealing with a bit of data. And then maybe you get that into another family like control stuff. So if you think about like TOPs, CHOPs and SOPs as like the core functionality groups of like building generative art, especially, at the end of the day, they're all just numbers. So if you think about you know, what's the best and fastest way I can process these numbers, there's pretty intuitive ways of, of moving that data back and forth. So like for a good example is 
you want to, what would be a good example? A perfect example is actually, I want to show you an ex instancing example in a moment. And actually we're going to do exactly this idea of treating everything as just data and then treating the operator families as just visualization tools and helpful, you know, maybe there's some helpful operators in one family that isn't in the other, but we can always take advantage of those by converting. Now, a good example from the instancing one that I'm going to show you is I basically want to copy an object in like, you know, we're going to take a box and copy it into a grid. So what's the fastest way that I can generate the data of a grid, which is like the point positions and X, Y positions. Well, it's actually to go and make a grid SOP. Then I have a grid. I can say, you know, how many rows and columns I want in that grid. Then I can easily use something like a SOP to chop to turn all of that position data back into channel data. And then once I'm in channel data, I can do all the things that I want to do, like manipulate it, you know, add some numbers, scale the values, all that kind of good stuff. Then I can feed that into the instancing and that's going to be the base of, you know, where we're going to get the point positions to copy our objects to, which comes from a chop, but actually originated from a SOP. But at the end of the day, like, what does it matter? It's, it's all just numbers flying around, right? And, and you'll get a better example of that when I, when I show you that in a moment. But, you know, so many of those workflows exist, especially now that GPU processing is becoming so popular. Uh, particle systems on the GPU are a good example because those are really just textures. And each one of the pixels in the textures represents like an X, Y, Z position. You know, the, the red channel becomes the X position. The Y channel becomes the green position. It, the green channel becomes the Y position and blue becomes the Z position. And then you're kind of just crunching numbers inside of a GLSL shader, which traditionally might have been like for just doing computer graphics stuff, but now we're just doing plain old math. And all that's happening in a completely, you know, it's, it's all just data, but it's happening in, in a non-intuitive space, unless you really just think about everything as data with some, you know, data is your base layer. And then on top of that, you have like, you know, these different operator families, but they're all kind of just accessing numbers at the end of the day. So I think that's like this, I'm trying to figure out the best way to like really wrap that in a, in a workshop -y type situation. But I think that's the way to think about it is think about the data that you want. Like, you know, if, especially if you're trying to make a product or an art piece or something and you're like, you know what, I kind of need, you know, I need noise data. And then you can think to yourself, okay, well, I could go the top route and go with like a noise top. And that's nice because I can visualize it really easily um, and I can do it in two dimensions. Or maybe I'll go with the noise chop route just because I just need random numbers generated. And then you can kind of base those decisions on, okay, well, what happens after that? Which family maybe has the more useful operators for me? Uh, so Graham is asking, so you recommend applying the UV core theory to all types of operators? Yeah, I think so, right? Like basically the idea of zero to one can be anything and you basically just interpolate through all of it. I mean, that's, that's kind of, it, it is kind of what I'm suggesting, I think, yeah, at, at a certain point. So with that said, let me actually show you this, this instancing example really quick, because um, then maybe that's helpful and it's a nice thing that we can kind of just talk through this, this idea of. So let me share my screen here. And have, Bram, have you done instancing before? Great, okay. So you might be familiar with some of the concepts uh, bear with me though, because I'll probably just use this easy example that I always use, which is that we essentially want to take uh, a box and instance it on a grid. So first thing I always do is I make my geometry. I'm going to go in here and delete torus. I don't know why torus is default. Like who's ever used a torus for like, no one's ever paid me to use a torus. This is, I don't know why torus is default. Anyways, I'm going to put a box, going to turn on the render and display flags. And I'm just going to remember to myself, the size is one, one, one this is also a common instancing error is that where you're instancing them makes them all too close together so you actually don't see the instancing happening and i can actually show you what that looks like but so i have my geometry it's got a box and to what the same way you had asked on the question was you know you go to the instancing page and here is where we're going to assign all of the data for where these copies are going to happen and the nice thing is that instancing happens on the gpu so it's really efficient and basically you just have to give the gpu an object like in this case we've given it our box and then we just have to give it data for where and how many of these boxes we want to throw down so 
what I like to, and this really goes back to this idea of just underlying data. If I wanna instance these boxes on a grid, I mean, how am I gonna figure out, you know, the, the points on a grid, right? Like I could probably do a bunch of math and, you know, modulo through some numbers and make a grid. Or I can already lean into the fact that in the SOP world, I can just drop down a grid SOP and, you know, I have this beautiful little grid here and I can hit W over the viewer to get a wireframe. And I have all of these beautiful aligned points ready to be used. Now, if you're not thinking about touch designer in terms of that fundamental data layer, you're gonna be like, oh, well, well, why would I make a grid? Like I need numbers to get to the instancing. But the nice part is that because everything is really just numbers at the bottom of it, you know, it, it's turtles all the way down, but for numbers, you know, if I put a null sop here, what I can do is make a sop to chop. And most families, uh, Bram, have you used a lot of these operators that do the conversions between families before? Like sop to chop, top to chop. Their names are impossible to say. I swear to God, their names are impossible to say. But, you know, like sop to chop, dat to, uh, dat to chop, sop to dat. Um, yeah, so if you've only used one today and not so frequently, these might become like a really good helpful um, tool that you can really lean into because, so for example, now we have a really easy generated grid of data. I'm going to drop down a SOP to chop, which basically takes SOP data and gives it to me in channels. And there you go. I have TX, TY, TZ positions of a grid. And now I could send this straight into my instancing. So I'm just going to go to my geo. Uh, it's going to want to know the instancing chop, dat, or SOP. Now I just do a caveat here because I'm still on the stable build. Uh, from, I guess, a couple weeks ago. Experimental build, this menu looks slightly different, but exact same fundamentals. Uh, and it may even be in the new stable. I'm not sure I haven't downloaded it yet. But anyway, so like in this case, I want to give it my operator that has all the data. So in this case, I can say my little chop here with my XYZ positions. And then what I have to do is just come down here and start assigning positions that I want to be related from my data set to the attributes in 3D. So for example, I have TX, TY, TZ. So I'm gonna to go to my translate X, Y, Z. And this nice little drop down. I can click here and say, okay, well, TX is gonna be my translate X. TY is gonna be my translate Y. And TZ is gonna be my translate Z. So now this is what happens a lot of the times when folks are just getting started with instancing. They look at this and they're like, well, it's not instancing. You know, I don't see, it's just my box still. The problem is that I don't like the default Everything by default is, is size one and one in 3D. So actually we're trying to instance a lot of boxes that are size one, one, and one on a grid that is also size one, one, and one. So we have two options. We'll either make our boxes smaller so they actually look like boxes on a grid because they're all based, what's happening is they're all just overlapped on top of each other. So we can either make the boxes smaller or we can make the grid bigger so that the spaces between the points, there's more of it. I like that version. I used to be uh, in the camp of I make my box small, but then I just found you get into like the really annoying part where, you know, you want to resize your box and it's like 0 0.003 instead of 0 0.004. I'm too old for that. I'm just going to, I'm going to make the, the grid bigger. Now here's the really cool part. So when we're thinking in this data, if I need to make my grid bigger, you know, if I was doing this with like some manual calculations or anything, I have to go through and change those. But since it's really just, you know, generates the grid from a grid sop. You just go to my grid sop, keep increasing the size, and eventually the size of the grid will be big enough that there's gonna be space in between the boxes. Now, does that make sense so far, Bram? Is that, is that like, are we good so far? I don't wanna lose you. He's nodding IRL, I love it. That's the best thing that could ever happen to me. So this is the basis of instancing. And really how complex you want to take it is, is up to you. You know, there's lots of channels here for RX, RY, RZ, scale, pivots, uh, you know, which direction they're facing, retexturing them, coloring them, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I'd recommend checking out in our Connect2 Fundamentals class. We actually make a point cloud with instancing, and that has some of the more advanced features. So that may be of interest for you. Actually, I think a lot of our a lot of our workshops use instancing. Uh, what Keen's asking regarding the SOPs, how do you read those points? Uh, it, 
Joaquin, are you asking about the soft chop? Yeah, so soft chop by default, or as you see, we see the soft chop has toggles and the toggles will turn on a lot of the default data and the only default data that exists in a regular old grid is normals, UVs, and point positions. That's why when I turn on the color RGB, nothing happens. But by default, the point position is on. So if I like make a, another soft to chop, we can see it doesn't do anything. We take the soft I want to read the point positions from, feed it in, and then we have XYZ. Now, a lot of these other ones, so normals, it did say exist, because if we middle click on the SOP, we can see point attributes N3, which says there's a normals, an array of three normals for XYZ. So that's why when I turn on the normals, I do get three extra channels. Uh, but so we can play with this now. And this is where I find also coming back to Graham, what we're saying, thinking about it in data is interesting. Because let's say I want to randomly generate a color for every single box. And you might say, okay, well, how, what's, what's my approach for that? Well, in some cases it matters what the approach is, but in a lot of cases it really doesn't matter. It's whatever you're comfortable with, right? So for example, what I could do is I could generate that in 3D. So what I could do is put a noise SOP down and change the attribute from position to actually be something like maybe diffuse color. So now all the points are gonna have a CD, which is going to be color data to them. So now if I go back to my SOP2, I could turn on color RGB to get the color data. And you can see I have a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel. And then if I go to my geometry, I can go to the second instancing page and near the bottom I have RGB channels. And I can assign those accordingly. And now I have the colors being sampled basically relative to what we were generating in our noise SOP. Or let's say I'm more comfortable in chops, right? It, it's all just data at the end of the day. So I can go back, delete that noise SOP, turn off the color RGB, and I can just make a noise chop. Maybe I just want to do it in chops. Now, this one has a little bit more things just to be aware of because we do have to make sure that the sample count between the two of them matches. So for example, this one has 400 samples. Our noise by default has 600. So you know, I may want to go to the channel parameters, change the start and end samples to actually be in units of samples and not time. Excuse me. And then I'll make this end at 399. So that way I have 400 samples. And this is a trick called pattern expansion, which you can check out on the wiki. I highly recommend. But uh, actually, you no, know what? I'll skip the pattern. I'm going to keep it simple. So I can just say CR, CG, CB with a space in between. That way I get three channels of color data. Now what I can do is just merge this back into my data set. And now essentially I'm doing the exact same thing, but now I'm generating it in SOPs. And actually I probably should put a math chop here because uh, by default noise chop is going to give me one to negative one, whereas my colors need to be between zero and one. So I'll just rearrange that using my friend and your new friend, the math chop. But so like, you know, which one of these you use may be dependent on the use case. But in terms of possibility, it's possible with either of them. So, you know, it, maybe I wanted to use the noise chop because I like the, the way it works better and I could change it to random and change the amplitude and, you know, all kinds of fun stuff from there. But I think for your case where you're figuring out more about like getting used to touch designer as opposed to finding the only best way to do it, I think it's totally fine to do it whichever way you want. And if you think about everything as just like an underlying data structure, and that's like your, your base class almost, and then above that you essentially have your different operator family that just provide helper functions for different ways of dealing with the data. Uh, based on some concepts where like SOPs are like based on 3D concept, and chops are based on, you know, channel concept and tops are based on like texture concepts, but that you can easily flip between them. So I, I, I mean, one more example, I swear, this is one more example to prove the point. Now I did the noise in the SOPs, I did the noise in the chops. Uh, now if, let me just do it in tops for fun, right? So I can make a noise top, turn off the monochrome, 
And then what I'll do with this, just to make it simple so I don't have to talk about shuffling, is I'm gonna change the resolution to match the data size here, which is 400 samples long, because I have 400 boxes. So I'm actually just gonna make this uh, 400 wide by one pixel tall. And then basically each one of my boxes is gonna take one pixel of color off of it. And then what I can do is, lo and behold, there is something called a top to chop, which takes top data and gives it to me back in channels. So then I can say, okay, well, I I'm just gonna change the channel names here so I don't have to go back to the geometry comp and reassign these channels. So it's gonna be C, R, C, G, C, B. I don't need alpha so I can delete the A. So now I can plug this in and now I have, you know, I was generating color in the tops, maybe because I wanted to do some, use level top or maybe I wanted to use blur to make it like really smooth. Maybe I had some uh, ideas of how to manipulate this data in textures more easily for my thought, but it is a pretty grid, I think. Uh, but you know, the point of the matter is like, there's so many ways to do things in touch designer. I, there's no wrong way. There are optimal ways, but I think especially when people are starting their touch designer journeys or even in the middle of your like career, you're still free to do like whatever, like whatever seems to be the most natural way. So if you're coming from even a computer science background, you may find staying inside of chops a lot is, you know, what might be more comfortable. Um, or you may find tops are the most exciting because it's like textures, or you might find like the sops are dope because it's like 3D and like really cool to visualize. Because like, let's say, you know, I, I put the noise sop again after it. And you can see like now it's, uh, actually let me turn the amplitude up. So now it's like doing point positions. So you're like, oh man, that's dope. Like I want to I play with that world for a little bit. Like you can totally just do that. And then later on down the line, if you're like, oh, you know what? I got like a critical gig coming up. You know, whether you ask me or you ask even on a Discord group, uh, hey, I'm trying to do this. This is the method I'm using now. Maybe the, the FPS is getting a little slow. What would be like a more optimal way to do this? Then you can go down the rabbit hole of like, okay, well, this is the best way or this is like the not the best way. But fundamentally, you could, you could do so many things in so many ways. So my recommendation is to just think about what's most exciting in terms of like you're wanting to explore. And then remember which areas you're pretty effective in. So like if you're coming from computer science background, like whether that's chops um, or whether DATS, I, I didn't include in that little like discussion just because DATS some, will, will hold strings and strings don't convert very well into tops or into chops usually. But very easily you could make a, a chop that generates noise, use a chop to DAT. I mean, let me I'll share my screen again. I don't know why I stopped sharing screen. You know, let's say you are, let's say you, because of your computer science strength, you're really comfortable with Python. And just as you're starting out, even though Python maybe is not the most optimal thing to use for a lot of data processing, it's the most comfortable for you to get like some cool results. So what you could do is let's say like you generated some noise in chops. You could then just use a chop to DAT, turn that into a giant table. And then you just set up your Python script right next to it, you know, and then you just do a for loop for through every row in the table and you're off to the races, right? You dump that, then you can just dump that into another table, you know, after you finish doing your heavy lifting, let me just make a fake table of data here for you. Because then the nice thing is then you can always just flip back. So I can then use a dat to chop, which lets me go from so this one's a little funny because you have to set the, the values and names correctly. So my first row is values and my first column is values. So there you go. So then, you know, you could have a little bit of touch designer stuff here. If you're comfortable working with Python because you're a computer science background, you do a bunch of stuff in there, this heavy lifting, then you dump it back into like a table or even a chop, and then you can get back into the touch designer world pretty quickly. So I would say like, don't worry too much about what's the best way figure out what way is most exciting for you that'll keep you like interested in your kind of like time exploring and like learning stuff. And then, then you can get down the, to the rabbit hole of like, you know, what's the best way versus this other way.